All right, welcome and hello to the Blizzard stage at Gamescom in Cologne. We're coming to you live from Germany. And as you can hear, everyone is as excited as can get in this lovely hall. And I'm pretty sure every World of Warcraft fan out there watching the stream is bursting with excitement because in just a few minutes, we're going to reveal the new World of Warcraft expansion. We're going to have three members of the lovely World of Warcraft development team coming here on this stage, revealing the expansion and sharing everything they can with us today. But before all of that is going to happen, I just want to make sure that we're all up at speed, right? We want to we know where we stand right now in World of Warcraft, and that's why we prepared a little video for you on the story so far. And i tell you something. Apparently, I have been told that there's a little surprise at the end, so let's try to watch out for that and let's look at the video. The Iron Horde will prevail, and all that stand against us will die. Storm the portal! Rise up, Iron Horde! Bring your war chief. This was not our destiny. You will all die! Just you. You must answer for your crimes, Garrosh. All I did... I did... For the horde! You chose your own destiny. How dare you show your face here, Kundan? You men have died for nothing. There is only one choice. Interesting. So now, of course, the big question is, where do we go next? What is happening next? And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one curious to that question. And that means we, we really want to know more, don't we? We do. We do indeed. And who better to ask some questions? And then the game director and vice president himself, Tom Chilton, ladies and gentlemen. Tom, it's always great to see you back. It's not your first Gamescom. Right. You're looking at so many excited faces. How excited are you about this announcement? No joke. This is really, really exciting. This is amazing. <laughs> I love coming to Gamescom, and, and frankly, this is why. Yeah, I mean, it's an amazing crowd. That's pretty darn obvious. Yeah, it really is. Now, you can tell the atmosphere here is pretty good, I would say. Yeah, it's pretty darn good. So. How is it in the office? You guys have been working on a secret for such a long time now. Yeah, we really have. Uh, we've been in production on this expansion for quite some time now. And uh, it's always very hard to you know, keep things under wraps and <laughs> talk about what's happening right now and not really spoil things for the future too much. Um, so it's really exciting for us, really gratifying for us to finally be able to share that with you all. Well, the good thing is I, I read a lot of suspicions and leaks, but yeah, I don't know. I don't think anyone really hit the nail so far. So that, no, no, no one did. And that makes it all the more exciting. Now, you brought us a little something to ease into the topic. What are we going to see now? Right, exactly. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you a video that it's really an important connecting point between the end of the storyline of Warlords of Draenor and the next expansion. 
And so hopefully you guys will really get excited for what that connecting point is. All right, so let's take a look at it. This is part of the CGI, if I understood correctly. Well, this is actually a completely independent piece that is just okay. meant to be a connecting tissue between the expansions. Um, you know, clearly Cadgar was right not to trust uh, <laughs> what just happened with Gul'dan, that we wouldn't see the last of him. Um, so Gul'dan, in much the same way that Garrosh Hellscream set in motion the events of Warlords of Draenor, Gul'dan is setting up the events of the next expansion. Oh my god. Guys, are you excited for this expansion or what? <laughs> wow. All right, but of course, there's a lot more before we're going to reveal because that, that isn't even the big reveal yet. There is more to come. You guys have more to share as you have a team of development uh, guys here on stage in just a bit to talk about it and uh, give some more in-depth views on it and see how much you can share. But he brought us another video, right? Yeah, we did. So uh, next up, we're going to see the actual announcement trailer with the features and content. So let's roll it. Hi. <laughs> yeah, so let's take a look at this announcement trailer right now. I'm Dranor. Old rivals sought to bring Azeroth to its knees. And while the Iron Tide was quelled, they were but servants of a more ancient foe that has not forgotten our defiance. The vengeance of the burning shadow has come. most desperate hour, we must wield the power of the enemy against them. For we stand once more upon the brink of destruction. The 
burning legion has returned. World of Warcraft Legion. That's the uh, next chapter in the saga of the World of Warcraft. So what we have for you next is actually going to be a uh, presentation by both myself and a couple of my other colleagues to go into more depth uh, on the content and the features. So hopefully you guys will learn a lot more about the expansion. But first, let me introduce my colleagues. First up, we have Alex Afraziabi, our creative director. So Alex was one of our very first quest designers, and he was actually the very first lead quest designer ever to exist on the World of Warcraft team. He's uh, driven a huge part of our story development for the last dozen years. So uh, Alex. Next up, we have Ian Hazakostas, lead game designer. So as lead game designer, Ian's responsible for a lot of things. Most recently, you guys may be aware that he's been responsible for our boss encounters for both dungeons and raids for many, many years now, several expansions. Um, in addition, he's been responsible for class design and other sorts of systems. So uh, really a huge, huge factor in the last you know, seven or eight years of World of Warcraft. Ian. All right, so to get to the point, we're first going to be talking about story, give you a little bit more insight into the events of World of Warcraft Legion. What you see on the screen right here is actually a teaser still shot from the introductory cinematic that will be revealed at a later date, coming relatively soon. So eat it up. Right there, clearly, a pretty significant character is involved. We'll also be talking about setting. As mentioned in the video, the Broken Isles is this new continent that players haven't experienced before, but has been referenced back in Warcraft 3. We'll be giving you more insight into the zones and the inhabitants of those zones and what happens. We'll also be talking about dungeons and raids. We've got to have dungeons and raids. We'll be talking about those artifact weapons you saw about. A little concept piece there from our team. Neat stuff. We'll be talking about Demon Hunters, of course. New class. And finally, the new PvP Honor System. We'll be going into detail on exactly what that is and how it works. So uh, I'm going to hand it off to Alex to talk about our story and setting. Thanks, Tom. Well, well. Hello, Gamescom. I am honored to be standing before you today to be talking about our new expansion. I do want to mention one thing. I am not Chris Metzen. I'm a little taller, my nose is bigger. That's how they tell us apart at work. All right, let's get to it. So Legion takes place on the Broken Isles. This is a land at the heart of Azeroth that is long forgotten. 10,000 years ago, before the Great Sundering, this whole area was a vast, bustling night elf civilization. And what we have now, after the world was destroyed, is the bones of that civilization. So this continent, in its entirety, is a graveyard of sorts. And it's on this continent that we will discover the tomb of Sargeras. That's right. Some old school, some old school War Three players. Now the tomb is an active gateway to endless Legion worlds, thanks to Gul'dan. A demonic invasion 
bigger than the War of the Ancients is currently underway. Let me repeat this. This is the biggest demonic invasion of Azeroth ever. And what are we going to do about it? We're going to sit around. We're going to fight. That's right, because that's what we do. And to do that, we're going to track down the source of this invasion at the Broken Shore and take the fight directly to Gul'dan and his demonic armies. And after a glorious battle at the Tomb of Sargeras, our story will begin. So this whole thing will actually start before the expansion even officially launches. The Broken Shore experience, someone's happy. The Broken Shore experience is like the Assault on the Dark Portal uh, for Warlords, but structured completely differently to help tell the story a little bit better. And I think one of the things that's going to happen after this experience is every single person in this room that has played WoW in the last five to ten years is going to be really, really surprised and shocked. 100% sure on that one. About right? I'm sure I'll get a lot of hate from Twitter on that. Okay, so let's get into it. Once the dust settles, after the Broken Shore, we will wake up to a world on fire and probably a massive headache. But we're not going to let a headache stop us from saving our world. Oh yes. We will wield, we will hoist up the fabled artifacts of those we have lost and those that have lost hope. And we will attempt to restore peace to a world on the brink of annihilation. And to help do that, we'll form class orders, powerful class orders, or renew old ones, like the Silver Hand. This this is a combination of extremely super exciting features for us. Ian's going to go into a lot more detail on that shortly, but it's amazing, guys. How are we feeling about those demon hunters, guys? Sorry, I can't hear you. I was getting water. How, how, how about those demon hunters? Good? We're going to need all the help we can get to fight the Burning Legion. And who better than demon hunters? I mean, it's in their name. But to do that properly for us, we need to establish context. Because guys, the last time we faced demon hunters at all, they all wanted to kill us, mostly. And after this, they may still want to kill us a little bit. So. We will see, through Illidan's eyes, the story of the demon hunters, the Illidari. We will go back to the moment during the siege of the Black Temple where we see Illidan send his demon hunter Illidari back on a special mission. So, anyone play Burning Crusade in here? Yeah! yeah. So you guys remember, back in the Burning Crusade, when we were running up the Black Temple in the halls, and we were all excited to go take out Illidan, and we're praying for Warglaives to drop. Well, Illidan had other things going on in the background, like sending his best, most elite demon hunters on a suicide mission. So we'll go through their past into the shattered, demonic prison world of Mardum. This is the world that Sargeras created when he was a good titan to hold all of the demons that he captured in the entirety of the universes. And when Sargeras went bad, 
This is the world he shattered and released what would become the Burning Legion. We'll go there. And we'll come into the present where we will go through the secret halls of the Vault of the Wardens. And when all is said and done, we will learn what it means to be a demon hunter and understand the true meaning of sacrifice. And we'll turn into awesome metamorphosized demon hunters. Tom's gonna talk on that later. But guys, this is Warcraft. And I did say that this was the biggest legion invasion we have ever faced. So I don't know if artifacts and demon hunters are gonna be enough. We're gonna have to turn to the big guy in the sky, or big guys and gals in the sky. And I'm talking about the Titans. Yes, no, no, well. We're gonna scour the broken isles for the pillars of creation. These are Titan relics that were used to shape the world when it was young, when it was first born. And it's only with these relics that we can actually close this massive gateway, this wound at the heart of the tomb of Sargeras. Now, speaking of help, Dalaran and the mages of the Kirin Tor, now led by Khadgar, will also be joining us. And that means Dalaran is going to be coming to the Broken Isles and, being, and becoming a main hub for players for this expansion. Let's hear some love for Dalaran. We all love it. Now, I can't say where Jaina went, but she was pissed off when she left. Now, let's talk about some zones in no particular order. Our quest to defeat the Burning Legion goes to Val Shara. Once the pinnacle of Druidism on Azeroth, now a forgotten Druid refuge on the Broken Isles. This is the place, guys, that Malfurion became the first druid under Cenarius. So this whole area is steeped in really rich lore, especially if you're a fan of night elven druidic lore. It's all here for you. Here we'll face Xavius, the nightmare lord, and his massive satyr armies. And what are they trying to do? What does Xavius always try to do? He's trying to unleash the emerald nightmare into our world. So along the way, we'll meet up with demigods, like Cenarius, and Aspects, probably Ysera, definitely Ysera, all to help us fight back the nightmare. And we'll also enter the Obsidian Fortress of Black Rickhold. So if you know your lore, you should be pretty stoked. Neen's gonna show you some awesome stuff there later too. But if we can't fight back Xavius and stop the nightmare from coming into our world, it's pointless. Pillar or no pillar, we can't beat the Legion. So what are we gonna do? We're going into the Emerald Nightmare and we're gonna dispense some justice. And while we're, we're there, we're gonna get a couple big glimpses into the Emerald Dream. We've been talking about it for a while and it's time. All right, on to Stormheim. Stormheim, in Stormheim, we're gonna uncover the fate of Vrykul that left Northrend thousands of years ago in search of their holy land. We'll discover the halls of Valor and Helheim, home to two Titan keepers that have been warring for thousands of years. We'll also learn of the origins of the Valkyr and the Kvaldir as we ride the massive ship of souls, the Naglfar, into the maw of hell. And all the while, while this is going on, we'll be fighting the Vrykul's God King and his minions, who are now pawns of the Burning Legion. Stormheim's a beautiful area, by the way, and totally scary. Azuna, oh, beautiful Azuna. So you know when I first talked about 
what this expansion was built upon, the bones, the bones of that ancient night elf civilization. Nowhere is it better represented than in Azuna. The first moment you step on the, on the territory, on the zone here, you will instantly see that this place was once something very special. And it's still special in a different way. Here we'll discover the ghosts of ancient night elves of the area, a dying breed of the blue dragon flight, and we'll be introduced to the night fallen, exiled royalty from Suramar that have been left to die outside the protected walls of their city. We'll also be racing someone named Queen Ajara and her minions for control of the pillar of creation in this zone. Overall, pretty epic experience. Moving on. High Mountain. High Mountain. At the highest point of the Broken Isles, we find High Mountain. Home to the High Mountain Torin, the keepers of the relic of Kazgoroth. Also, the keepers of really badass horns, if you paid attention to that cinematic before us. If you didn't, you gotta check it out. Huge elk horns. High Mountain's rough terrain. Rough, tough, it'll kill you. Which is why only the biggest and strongest creatures of the Broken Isles live up here. Like the Drogbar. And we're gonna have to kill a lot of Drogbar to save this world. And while we're there, we're gonna visit the lair of the Earth Warder, Neltharion, and seek some answers, and hopefully get some answers. For those of you that don't know, Neltharion, during the War of the Ancients, became Deathwing. You know, that guy knows. Became Deathwing, and then during Cataclysm, he just became dead. And so, we don't have him to worry about anymore, but we have other things. While we're up here, we may also run into some other friends. This is a big area, there's big game, there's a big hunt. Nessing where he's gonna be close by. A lot of Nessing where he love. And lastly for today, guys, I'm gonna hit on Suramar. At the heart of Suramar, we will discover a new race of elves. Made off of an old race of elves. These elves have lived here for the last 10,000 years and flourished from the use or abuse of their incredible magical ability. Unfortunately, they have become pawns of the Burning Legion as well. More bad news, they have the last relic that we need. So what that means is we'll have to kill every single one of them, plus all of the elite Legion guards that guard their city, and probably Gul'dan to secure that last relic. I didn't say it was gonna be easy. One last thing before I hand it off to Ian. I wanna head off one question. I know there will be thousands of them after this presentation is over, but one question. This is a question that we have been asked at every single BlizzCon since the inception of BlizzCon. And I'm happy to announce it here at Gamescom. What about Valeria and Toralian? Their time is here. Thank you. Ian? All right, hello Gamescom. Thank you, Alex, for that great introduction to the Broken Isles and the World of Legion. And I want to talk a bit about artifacts and class orders that you saw in the intro video, and then we'll move on to talk about dungeons and raids. So, artifacts. Weapons, obviously, but what are they? What's the deal with them? So, as Alex mentioned, the Legion represents the greatest single threat to our world that we have ever faced. And in order to fight this ultimate enemy, we need the ultimate weapons. We need weapons of greater power than any we've ever had before in order to stand a chance. And that's where artifacts come into play. Every single specialization in the game is going to have their own artifact to seek out and to wield and to use against the Legion. 
So depending on your class and your spec, that will heavily affect the way your story plays out and what you're interacting with in terms of the system. So well, what are they? How do they fit in? The first thing you're going to do when you begin the Legion experience after the events of the Broken Shore is seek out the artifact for your spec. Follow your destiny and heed that calling to take up this ultimate weapon. And that experience is going to vary depending on you know, what class and what spec you play. So for example, if you're a retribution paladin, you'll be returning to the location of the Broken Shore to find and seek out Ashbringer, where it fell in battle and was lost, so that you can take it up and wield it. If you're a protection warrior, you will follow up on the legends of an ancient Vrykul king who was buried with a sword and shield forged from the scales of the dragon Neltharion, who later went on to become Deathwing. You will delve into his tomb and overcome the ancient curses that lay there in order to wield those weapons for yourself. If you're a Frost Death Knight, well, what is the ultimate Frost Death Knight weapon? Frostmourne, right? Well, Frostmourne was shattered. But the first thing you're going to do is go to Ice Crown Citadel, find and seek out the shards of the weapon where they lay after the fateful encounter with the Lich King at the end of Wrath of the Lich King. You will take those shards up and you will reforge them into a pair of rune blades that are the ultimate Frost Death Knight weapons. So these artifacts, they are your true companions. They are the things upon which you will rely as you journey through the Broken Isles and through the world of Legion. As you, you know, level up, you gain experience, your character gains levels. But as you accomplish deeds in the world, you will also earn artifact power for your weapon. Artifact power is something you will earn through a wide variety of activities, whether completing a major quest line, killing a dungeon boss, outdoor objectives, winning a PvP battleground, virtually any major type of activity in World of Warcraft will contribute to leveling up your artifact. Now this artifact power that you earn, what do you do with it? Well, you're gonna spend it to unlock traits that empower your weapon and empower your own character. In addition, you can also have a number of visual customizations that you'll be able to unlock and explore. Ultimately, you control the destiny of your artifact. You customize the path in which you unlock those traits and you choose your path to greatness. Now let's get into the system a little bit more. So, Ashbringer. Um, this is a, a quick screenshot of the UI for Ashbringer. Now, each artifact has a trait tree like this. It's kind of a grid that over, is overlaid on the outline of the weapon itself. And as you earn artifact power, you can spend them to unlock these traits. Once you unlock a trait, the adjacent nodes unlock and become things that you can spend a power in. And ultimately, you choose what you want to work towards. You choose how you want to navigate this tree and what you want your weapon to be. And at the far ends of the trees are major impactful abilities, such as the one we see on the screen here. This is something that will essentially cause your Ashbringer to duplicate some of your most powerful abilities. Let's look at the Frost Death Knights. Um, again, different weapons, different silhouette to the weapons, and therefore a different outline to the grid, but ultimately the same general concept. You, you know, begin at a central location and work your way towards the things that you most want as you earn power, spend that power on traits, and unlock powers. Some of these are going to be simple damage increases. Others are things that transform your rotation. Others are new major types of utility, like the one we see here, that allows a Death Knight to basically use Ray's ally on themselves to resurrect themselves in the heat of battle. Now, visual customization. So this was something that maybe may have flashed by really quickly in the, uh, in the trailer earlier. As we see in the menu here, this Ashbringer, but then also a number of different variants on Ashbringer. Now, we understand that in a world where many Red Paladins will wield Ashbringer, it's important to really be able to feel unique and like your, expression is a represent, like your weapon is an expression of the character that you want to play, of the things that you value, and of your accomplishments in the world. So these different looks to the weapon are things that you will be able to unlock through a wide variety of means. Some of them simply by leveling up your weapon, others by completing specific activities, whether they be raiding or PvP oriented or more completionist things in the world as a whole. And within each of these looks, there's also a large number of color variants. So there's a tremendous total number of combinations for how you can have your artifact look. Now with Ashbringer, what we generally did and what we've done with all of the artifacts is you get the base weapon that looks like the sword you know and love that you've always seen in Tyrion Forgering's hand. It's the Ashbringer. Then there's sort of an evolved, upgraded version of it that once you, you know, reach a certain level of power with your weapon, you'll be able to unlock. 
but then we gave our artists the challenge of really just going off in exciting new different directions with these weapons, of trying to reimagine the fantasy of the sword, and that led us to things like an Ashbringer that's made out of pure fire, or a corrupted shadowy Ashbringer, or one that is shattered and being held together by crackling lightning. All of these have the basic silhouette of the weapon we know, but they have a very, very different feel ultimately, and they'll be things for you to work towards and use as an expression of the character you want to play. So I know I've talked a lot about Ashbringer. Um, let's look at some other weapons. So if you're a Mistweaver monk, your adventure will begin by returning to Pandaria to seek out the staff of the Emperor Shao Hao, who's you know, really integral to the very legend and the essence of the continent of Pandaria. So here on the far left, we see the base weapon that you'll initially acquire, then an upgraded version of it. But then we've reimagined that staff in the, you know, with the inspiration drawn from the various animal gods of Pandaria, whether it's Yulon, the Jade Serpent in the center, or Chi Ji, the Red Crane on the far right, or a Sha-influenced, Sha-corrupted staff, second from the right in between those two. Those are all things to work towards, and again, you can kind of pick the look that you want, pick the thing that excites you most to be what you show off. Ashbringer. Exactly. I honestly, I can't say enough about the amazing art and the work that our artists have done on these weapons. They, they just blow us away. Um, so yeah, the base Ashbringer, the holy version, and then fiery, shadowy, and lightning. Large variants, but they all have that essence that says this is Ashbringer. Next up, a new one to many people. So Philoma Lorne. This was actually a spell sword wielded by Archmage, by the mage Kael'thas. Um, Kael'thas used this in his battle against the Lich King at Ice Crown Citadel, and the sword was lost there. So if you play a Fire Mage, you will begin the expansion by seeking out that blade. And when you take it up, you see the base version on the left. It is, you know, a very Blood Elf origin fire spell blade, an evolved version, but then the fantasy goes in different directions from there if you want to customize it in a fell direction or sort of a molten lava direction or that heavy Titan-influenced one on the far right that has a very different feel to it. It's all up to you. The Eagle Spear. So this is, this is something that is a new, new to the lore. Um, it's heavily associated with the High Mountain Torrin. This is basically a fabled weapon of the Torrin tribe in High Mountain that you will seek out. You will track down the powerful creature that claimed the life of its last wielder, defeat that creature, and take this for yourself. Um, the animal inspirations for the spear, you see, the base version is, you know, sort of you know, themed after the eagle. Then in the center, we have a wolf theme, a serpent, and a bear on the far right. Uh, this weapon will be something that survival hunters can seek out and claim. So next up, Frost Death Knights. So the, the, these are the blades that you will forge from the shattered shards of the greatest Death Knight weapon of all time, Frostmourne the base version on the left, and then the initial upgraded version second from the left. Now for these weapons, we actually didn't go in such crazy different directions. We didn't do a fiery sword. I mean, they're all kind of, it's a question of what you like most as Death Knight. Do you like skulls or frost or more skulls or different skulls? But they're all different variations on the essence, the fantasy of what being a Death Knight is. And you know, when you think Runeblade, this is what comes to mind. That is what your artifact needs to mean to you. Doomhammer. So this weapon will be claimed by Enhancement Shamans. Enhancement Shamans will seek them out and pair this hammer with, an, with a, you know, a pair in your offhand that is made of pure energy so that you can dual wield properly. The base version, of course, the one we know and love that we've seen Thrall carrying around for so long, and then various you know, variants of it, the fell version in the center, a fiery one to the right of that, and then a, a magical crystalline one on the far right. All the essence of Doomhammer, but different fantasies to explore. Let's see, what's up next? So, Feral Druids. So, Feral Druids can seek out the fangs of the first Night Saber. And on the far left here, we see a Druid with the base initial artifact that just claimed it. He's like a level 100 Druid. He's been playing the expansion for an hour or two. In the middle, we see a Druid with the upgraded fangs of the first Night Saber. Uh, he's you know, been playing for much longer, has attained a more powerful artifact. On the far right side, we see a druid with spectral fangs of the Night Saber, and it's a totally different look of the weapon. I mean, you can see how awesome the weapon is, right? 
Oh, right, yeah. I guess you can't really see the weapons on, on Feral Druids and Guardians. That's a shame. I mean, being able to customize your weapons so much and then not being able to show it off, well, that's unfortunate. OK, just kidding. So, so if you're a Feral Druid or if you're a Guardian Druid, instead of customizing the look of your artifact, you will customize the look of your form. So on the left, here we see an, a Druid with the base fangs for the first Night Saber. On the right, that's Spectral Variant. Now, of course, there's many different color variations on each of these and more addi entirely different models that we just couldn't fit on this slide, but there'll be the same number of variants as every other class has. So that's something for you know, Feral Druids and Guardian Druids to look forward to. Oh, and by the way, yeah, on the last slide, that was an updated high-res version of the base cat form, in case you were wondering. OK, so that's some of what artifacts have in store for you. We're going to have a lot more to discuss you know, in the future, but that should kind of give you the gist of what they're all about. Now, class orders. So as Alex mentioned, in the aftermath of the events at the Broken Shore, our world is in flames. And we are struggling to survive in the face of the Legion threat that will just overwhelm and destroy us all if we don't stop it. And the Alliance and Horde, they're just not going to be able to come together and work together in the ways that need to happen to overcome this threat. But instead, it's the classes that actually band together to do that. Whether it's ancient orders like the Silver Hand at Light's Hope Chapel or the Mages of Dalaran, they're coming together, working together as a class to save the world and to do what needs to be done. And of course, they look to you as their leader because you are the one who has just retrieved a fabled artifact of incomparable power. You are the wielder of Ashbringer. You are the wielder of Doomhammer. Who else would lead them if not you? And so this really underscores one of the central themes of the Legion expansion, which is really a heavy focus on class identity. We want you to feel, if you're a warlock, to feel like a warlock, and for that to feel different than being a paladin, because they're about very different things. Even if their goals are the same at the end of the day, which is to defeat the Legion, they're going to go about it in very different ways. They're going to have very different allies. They're going to have very different powers to call upon in the process. So the, the order halls represent a base of operations for your class. They're kind of like a private clubhouse that you share with other members of your class. It's a shared space where you'll see other paladins running around or other shamans. It's not personal like the garrison, but it is a private space just for members of your class. Um, the best analog is probably something like Acherus, the Death Knights are familiar with, you know, the, the necropolis floating above the Plaguelands that is only accessible to Death Knights. So, and these will be in locations that are thematically appropriate. And one of the, the sort of the second thing you do after claiming your artifact is going to be to found and you know, come, come upon your order hall and establish it. So shamans will be in a hollowed out cave overlooking the maelstrom at a point where all of the elements come together, where lightning crackles in the sky overhead and molten earth churns in the middle of a swirling whirlpool. Paladins are going to discover a hidden Templar sanctum beneath Light's Hope Chapel where they will make their home. Now, warlocks, warlocks really aren't comfortable unless there's, you know, fell fire raining from the sky, demons all over the place. So the warlock order hall is actually going to be on a legion portal world where, you know, they, they, only they can travel because that's what they do. That's what warlocks are. That's part of being a warlock. So this is a, a screenshot of the paladin class order hall beneath Light's Hope. Um, this was you know, something that was shown briefly in the video. And every class is going to have their own unique space that they will return to with unique functions. This will be the place where you go to customize and upgrade your artifact. This will be the place where you have certain special quests and other missions available to you. And it's you know, tied to your class identity, first and foremost. So in your order hall, you're going to have champions of your class, of your order. Now, this is an evolution of the Draenor follower system. Whereas in Draenor, you were raising an army, right? The, uh, you needed to defeat the Iron Horde, so you went out into the world and you were recruiting anyone that you could get your hands on, regardless of what race they were, regardless of what class they were. Anyone who wanted to help you fight the Iron Horde, you wanted their help. But numbers are not going to work against the Burning Legion. We can't defeat them through numbers alone. They are infinite. If we don't seal the portal of the Tomb of Sargeras, nothing will stop them. So your champions, if you're a paladin, or maybe minions if you're a warlock, or you know, apprentices or adepts if you're a mage, 
Um, these are far fewer in number, but far more important. Many of them may be established characters like Lady Liadrin, the Blood Elf Paladin, and they are going to have more customization, but more importantly, more integration with the world. Our idea, in terms of how we want to carry this system forward, is not to have your followers or your champions doing things instead of you, but to have them enabling you to do greater deeds and to go out into the world. So maybe they go on a scouting mission and discover an evil, a lair that you then go to investigate. Or maybe you send them to a zone that then gives you bonuses when you are adventuring in that zone and completing objectives there. You'll work alongside them and with them rather than sort of having them compete with you in terms of the rewards that you're getting and that you're seeking out. We'll have a lot more to talk about regarding the system in the future, but I just wanted to kind of lay out some of our general philosophies for how we're thinking about it and how it's different from the garrisons and followers in Draenor. So, dungeons and raids. So I'm going to start with dungeons. And before I go into any specifics, um, I want to just take a minute to stress that we feel like we've done dungeons a bit of a disservice. Dungeons are essential. They are at the heart of what makes the MMO experience awesome. Going into a dungeon is going in and cooperating with a small group of your friends to overcome a challenge. And we want to make sure that there are more dungeons in Legion than before, that there is more varied challenges, more replayability, and more of a long-term reason to keep doing dungeons throughout the expansion. We don't want dungeons to be something that you just do for a month at the start and then forget once you've started to do raids. That said, let's talk specifics. So first up, um, the Halls of Valor. As Alex mentioned, um, this is a, one of the level of dungeons that is high up in the clouds over Stormheim. And this is sort of a look at the dungeon itself. This is sort of the look at the grand entrance. This is what you see when you first zone in. The Halls of Valor, very heavily inspired by Valhalla, right? the core Norse Viking fantasy. This is the place where the greatest warriors of the Vrykul are called to serve in the skies. And this is, this is their eternal reward for being the greatest. Now, what brings you here is actually, uh, over the course of Stormheim, as you are seeking out the pillar of creation from this zone that will help you seal up the tomb of Sargeras, you are contending with the Legion cooperating leader of the Vrykul, the God King. And as you contend with him and race against him through the zone, both of your paths lead you to this place, which is the ultimate resting location of the pillar, and you must prove yourself worthy in battle so that you may claim it and not him. Otherwise, we're all doomed. Also in this place, we're gonna learn a lot more and witness more about the origin of the Valkyr. Now, these are not the undead, scourge-influenced Valkyr that you remember in Northrend. This is the more pure Valkyr, the shield maiden, the warrior of the light, um, that is as core a part of the fantasy as the Vrykul themselves. Next, Black Rook Hold. Black Rook Hold is going to be a max-level dungeon in the zone of Val Shara. This was the ancestral home of, uh, of Lord Ravencrest. And this is an elven structure unlike any elven structure you've ever seen before. It was a military fortress, a bulwark against the Legion, that was carved out of a single giant piece of stone, basically carved out of the mountain itself to be this impenetrable, unassailable fortress. But a dark shadow has fallen across this place now. So here we see a screenshot of this is sort of the interior main entry hall of Black Rook Hold. I think next up, yeah, this is another, this is a side hallway. You can see some light streaming in from the windows. Um, players are going to begin essentially in the basement, in the underground catacombs beneath Black Rook Hold, and work their way from the outside all the way to the very top of the spire, where they will confront the true threat and the evil that is corrupting the castle itself. This is a look from the outside courtyard, looking up at the walls and towers of the complex. This is an elven structure, but again, it's not quite like any elven structure you may have seen before. Next, the Vault of the Wardens. So this is a place that will be very familiar to demon hunters. As a demon hunter, and Tom will tell you a bit about this in the, you know, in the next bit, this is where you awaken. Um, this was the Warden Maximum Security Facility. Wardens being you know, those awesome cloaked figures like Maiev that you may remember from Burning Crusade. Um, this is where they have kept all of the greatest threats to the world. Demon hunters among them, but also countless other terrifying monsters. And this is the place 
were the events of that cinematic that you saw before the patch announced, before the expansion announcement trailer happened, where Gul'dan found Illidan, where he was encased beneath the vault. Now, what was he up to? What is his plan? What is his purpose? We don't know, but it's a sure bet that it's nothing good. It's nothing that we want to have happen. And so we're going to begin investigating that mystery. We're going to begin a hunting down Gul'dan and Illidan in this place. So here we see this is the, one of the top levels of the Vault of the Wardens. Um, we see some of the owl symbolism and that crescent half moon shape that is their characteristic glaive that they wield. We see that prominently throughout this place. Very ornate, but also a place of great darkness and great evil. This is a lower level of the dungeon. You see cells lining the walls where all manner of former inhabitants have been kept. So then, of course, we're going to have more dungeons. So let me talk quickly about some of those. So first off, uh, we're going to have a dungeon in Azuna where you contend with the minions of Queen Ashara, with the Naga, that have been thwarting your actions every step of the way through the zone. We figured Eye of Ashara would be a good name for it for some reason. I'm not sure. Next up, Darkheart Thicket. This is in Valshara. This is at the foot, the base of the World Tree Saladris Hill that towers over the zone as a whole. This is the heart of the nightmare corruption that is infesting and spreading through the zone and will, which will eventually overtake our world if we don't stop it. So you are going, cutting your way through dark thickets and brambles into a chamber at the base of the tree itself where you need to rescue Malfurion himself from the corruption and the clutches of the nightmare. Another dungeon is going to be Nothariun's Lair. Nothariun's Lair, as Alex mentioned, is in High Mountain. This was a cavern where thousands of years ago, the Earth Warder, the Black Dragon Notharian, lived. This was before he became Deathwing, before his corruption, but he was still the most massive, the most giant of all the dragons. And the space that he's hollowed out reflects that. Since those times, this has become the center of the Drogbar society. These are these sort of rocky, fierce, brutal warriors of High Mountain. And we need to venture into their capital in order to recover the pillar of creation wielded by their chieftain. Helheim. Helheim, well, it's sort of in Stormheim, but it's not precisely in Stormheim. This is kind of the polar opposite of the Halls of Valor. Whereas the greatest warriors of the Vrypool ascend to the Halls of Valor, the cursed spirits get on the ship, Niflvar, that leads them to Helheim, where they are cursed for, existence, for all eternity as Kvaldir. Now, if you like the Grim Rail Depot dungeon in Warlords, if you like the idea of riding a train, well, I think you're going to like this one. Um, this is the ghost ship of the damned. And most of the dungeon takes place on this ship sailing through stormy seas in an immersive environment that's quite unlike anything we've ever seen in a dungeon in WoW before. Really excited to you know, get people to have their eyes on it. Next, Suramar City. This is the city of night. Um, where the Nightborn rule from their palace, but the city itself contains both catacombs beneath it and noble houses throughout the city, into which we will have to venture in order to you know, uncover the ties to the Legion and the ultimate plan that is unfolding here. And, well, Violet Hold. So Dalaran, of course, is coming with us to the Broken Isles, and that means Violet Hold is coming with it. Now, it turns out there were some mysteries and deep secrets hidden within this place that we never uncovered the first time we were here. And bringing the city in proximity to the tomb of Sargeras, once it comes to the Broken Isles, it awakens new secrets, new powers, new mysteries in this prison that we have to delve into, explore, and uncover. And we're going to learn a lot more about the origins of Dalaran, the origins of the mages of Dalaran, and actually the origins of the world itself. Raids. So for raids, we're actually pretty happy with how the overall structure in Warlords of Draenor played out. Um, we had you know, a high mall initially with seven bosses that opened up a few weeks after the release of the expansion. And then sometime after that, Blackrock Foundry with 10 bosses. So we're keeping that overall structure. We think that's a good amount of raid content. And that's kind of what we're aiming for. And that's what we want to deliver in Legion. So the first raid, this is going to be the Emerald Nightmare itself. Uh, we have heard from players as long as we can remember since really the first days of World of Warcraft that they wanted to see the Emerald Dream. You fought those green dragons that came out of the portals, the four green dragons in early WoW. 
and you just wanted to go through those portals to see what was on the other side, right? Well, now you get to. The Emerald Dream was created by the Titans as a blueprint for Azeroth itself. It was the perfect, untarnished, unspoiled version of our world, verdant and green and full of life. But something has gone horribly wrong here, and the Emerald Dream has descended into corruption, into nightmare, and that threatens to spread into our world and engulf it. So, whereas in the dungeon, we descend into the roots of the tree, for the raid, we're initially actually going to climb up into the tree itself and actually cross through the barrier that separates our reality from the reality of the dream. We will go in, root out corruption, seek out scenarios, and ultimately confront Xavius himself at the heart of the nightmare in this ultimate conflict that will end the corruption of the Emerald Dream. Our next raid, Suramar Palace. So this is the palace in the city of Suramar. Um, where the Grand Magistrix, who has brokered this dark deal with the Legion, looks over everything and runs the city. The Legion has come here for a dark purpose, and they, and they have used and corrupted one of the titan pillars of creation to shape their society, to create this Nightwell, a conduit of dark energy that is the center of Suramar's power. So this is a 10-boss raid, very traditional, somewhat reminiscent of Black Temple in terms of its layout and structure. You begin in an underground catacomb, essentially a back entry because you can't go through the front gate, work your way up to sort of outdoor balconies, royal quarters, and eventually to the heart of the Nightwell itself. We will confront both the Grand Magistrix and Gul'dan, who has come here as an ambassador of the Legion. We've been chasing Gul'dan for a long time, since really the beginning of Warlords of Draenor, when we made that fateful mistake of clicking on him and setting him free to begin our Warlords experience. But finally, he's cornered, he's not going to be able to run after this. Gul'dan is the ultimate boss of Suramar Palace Raid. Now, I just wanted to show you a concept of what the palace itself is going to look like. And now I know if you, if you really love orcs and spikes and fire and fell, this might disappoint you. I know you might have been hoping for yet another raid since you heard Gul'dan, okay, it's going to be a green orc raid, right? No. This is the royal elven city, the palace of Suramar. This, they are an el elevated, elegant, magical race, magical civilization, and their architecture reflects that. So this is gonna be a very different type of look for a raid than we've seen in the recent past, and I can't wait to have you explore it. Can't wait until you can see it for yourselves. So without further ado, let's hear more about the thing you all wanna hear about. Let me hand it off to Tom, and he'll tell you all about the Demon Hunter. <clears throat> All right, the Demon Hunter. Demon and Jaeger. Yeah? Let's talk first about character creation. Obviously, character creation is a huge part of uh, building your character and really getting into it, getting a sense for what the character is. So, we have a slew of different options for you that are really unique to the Demon Hunter so that you can really feel like it's properly the, you know, expressing the class. So here's a lineup of a variety of different options that we'll have for you. As you can see, one of the kind of features that first jumps out and grabs your eyes is, is the horns. Uh, the demon hunters have the ability to have horns, a number of different horn styles, horn types, horn sizes. We'll even have the option to have no horns at all if there's something mentally wrong with you. Of course, we have some other features too. We have the tattoos that you see. A lot of demon hunter class specific armor really kind of exposes those muscles so you can show off your awesome tats. Different types of tattoos, different shapes, different colors, all sorts of good times there. We have skin variations, some of them scaly and demonic, others normal. And then finally, we also have the different types of eyewear. So you can have the traditional Illidan style eyewear, or you can have a veil or some other different kinds of looks. So, you know, taking a look at all that and really kind of getting a sense for what that is, let's look at what that looks like on the actual character creation screen. So right at the end there, you got to get a little glimpse into what it looks like to be a metamorphosized demon hunter. 
So uh, let's take a look at what that is, and let's, let's explore more what the uh, entire Demon Hunter experience is. And so the Demon Hunter, as you might have seen in the video, is a hero class. And to us, what that means is they have a very unique starting experience, a lot the same way that the Death Knight did in Wrath of the Lich King. So the Demon Hunter will both have that unique kind of experience and also start at a very high level so that you can immediately flow into the Legion content and not have to go through older content to do that. So the Demon Hunter Awoken. Demon Hunter first comes into our storyline after having been awoken in the Vault of the Wardens. The Wardens, desperate because of the Legion invasions, have thrown the switch to awaken the Demon Hunters, desperate for their help, because when you're going to fight the Legion, Demon Hunters might come in handy. It's kind of part of the name, like Alex said. But before you do that, you'll actually get to take part in the events that take place 10 years back in time at the Black Temple when you, as a member of the Illidari, are sent off by Illidan on a crucial mission to the world of Mardum. And so you get to see that little world of Mardum right here. Take a look at a video that shows that. So that's a little glimpse, a little glimpse of what our world would look like as Azeroth if we fail in our mission to stop the Legion. Don't want that. Otherwise, might as well all be warlocks. All right, so next up, we want to talk a little bit about specs and skills. So the Demon Hunter obviously is going to have specs like other classes will. And those specs that we're going to be talking about are Havoc and Vengeance. Havoc is the DPS spec, Vengeance being a tanking spec. So for the Demon Hunters, we're actually going to be doing two specs. The reason for that is as we thought about you know, Demon Hunters and what they might be and what the fantasy of a Demon Hunter is, clearly DPS comes to mind. I mean, it would, we would be remiss if we didn't include DPS. So that's kind of an automatic. We also thought it'd be really cool because metamorphosis is a big part of being a Demon Hunter and we have these awesome metamorphic metamorphosized forms that'd be great to be a tank. That could be a really fun experience that makes sense with being a demon hunter also. Demon hunter healer though? Yeah, not so much. A little bit weird for us, so uh, it felt like that was kind of out of the picture. So at that point, the question becomes, do we do two demon hunter DPS specs, or do we do two tanking specs? And as we really started to flesh out what the ideas for those specs might be, we felt like it was just kind of watering down the identity of the class. So instead, we wanted to concentrate the coolness and really focus on one melee spec, one DPS, and one tanking spec. So we feel like that's really the right thing for the Demon Hunter to make them both awesome. So here's a couple of different abilities that are unique to Demon Hunters, of course. The first one we have here is Fell Rush, where you can rush forward, dealing a bunch of damage to anybody in your path. Generates Fury, also Demonic Fury. That's your resource. Um, as you use some abilities, they build up Demonic Fury, and other abilities cost Demonic Fury. Felrush also has an interesting characteristic of having multiple charges. So you can charge multiple times in battle. We have Chaos Strike, which is a pretty basic Demonic Fury spender to do a bunch of damage, everybody in front of you. Chaos Nova, that does area effect damage and also stuns people in a radius on a cooldown. You can also use a ranged ability called Eye Beam. Use those cool little eye, eyewear that you have to focus those beams, zap a bunch of enemies at range. Spectrosite, that's something that's very unique to Demon Hunters and really kind of a defining trait of Demon Hunters. The ability there is when you turn on Spectrosite, and that's kind of part of why you pulled your eyes out to be a Demon Hunter, is that it gives you the ability to see through walls. So you can see your enemies through, through the walls come in really handy in a lot of Battlegrounds. In addition, Vengeful Retreat, another movement ability that helps keep Demon Hunters really mobile. 
But of course, if a demon hunter is going to retreat, he's going to do it vengefully. So first, I've, we've got a couple little videos to show you of what some of these abilities look like. The first one you're going to see is Fell Rush, just a very simple kind of dash forward. So let's look at that. There you go, M used multiple times in succession, right away, boom, boom. Wants to travel, wants to go through and deal damage. Next up, we have the I-beam ability, give you a little sense of what that looks like. Zap. And then finally, we have an ability that's also unique to Demon Hunters to talk about that I haven't mentioned yet. That ability is something that we call double jump. So as a Demon Hunter, you're actually going to be able to jump, and then as you're in the air, jump again, because you're more agile, you're quicker than other races or, or classes, and you know it's really cool and handy to be able to get over obstacles that no other class can actually get over. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Oh yeah, double jump. So next up we have a little video that has a couple of these different combat abilities mixed together to give you a little bit more of a sense of what Demon Hunter combat looks and feels like. Good times. All right, so hopefully you guys are excited to, to play Demon Hunters as we are. Uh, I know around the office we're all kind of crazy in the head about it, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Next up, I want to talk about the new PvP Honor System. Now, as we mentioned in this video, we're doing an entirely new PvP Honor System, calling this version 3. And so to set a little bit of context for that, I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of the honor system over time and you know, set the foundation for why it is that we're going to do what we're doing. So let's back, look back to version one. So I had the, uh, the great honor and opportunity to, uh, honor, <laughs> to uh, be able to do a lot of the design work on the original honor system. And you know, at the time when we first launched it, uh, early in World of Warcraft's lifetime, um, it was really intended to be something that, that gave players that wanted PvP something to you know, get excited about and be able to progress in. But it had a couple of critical flaws that, that led to it being phased out in Burning Crusade. I don't know how many of you played back in the day, uh, the original honor system. Eh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, it, and it was pretty cool for a while. And that's because anytime you killed enemy players, you did battlegrounds, captured objectives, that sort of thing, you would gain honor. And at the end of the week, we would tally up all the honor that each player got. And then we would rank them based on how much the honor they got compared to each other, which is fine and dandy in theory. The problem is you guys are willing to spend an incredible amount of time every single day farming honor, making it impossible for a lot of people to keep up. We had players that weren't even playing their own characters, having their guildmates log in their characters so they could be the number one honor character that week. Literally 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that character had to be in Battlegrounds, uh, you know, fighting to, to retain their rank. And the moment they stopped, even after becoming a high warlord or grand marshal, they started losing their ranks. So that was a little bit too brutal. So in Burning Crusade, we moved to a system that was a lot simpler. It's also you know, carried us for a long time from Burning Crusade all the way to, to Warlords. That system is essentially a currency system, right? You, you kill enemy players, you get honor from battleground objectives, etc., cetera, and you, know, you get currency, you then buy stuff with it, buy PvP gear. It introduced the concept of PvP gear, um, and you know, this kind of gave us one little tuning point for PvP. It meant that we could do set bonuses that would alter your character a little bit, but you know, ultimately, it was still uh, you know, essentially the same character that you're playing in PvE. And that had a lot of limitations. And you know, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's gotten aged. Um, we feel like it's really time to update it and address some of those core issues. For example, you know, we've gotten a lot of feedback that gear has way too much to do with PvP. And so we really want to dial back the effect that gear has. For example, if you look at a character here on the left, you're going to see a character that has the introductory armor gear. And, you know, their base item level, in this case, is only 620. 
you have a character on the right that has the fully maxed out conquest gear and their item level at 700 makes them 80% more powerful, almost twice as powerful, um, even when you factor in both of them sca getting scaled up for, uh, for PvP. Um, almost twice as powerful as the other player. And that doesn't really feel right in PV PvP. It's just not that fun to have players running around with that huge of a power disparity. So we felt like we needed a new system that addresses that and uh, really kind of makes sure that while gear can play a role, it plays almost no role in terms of how powerful you are. So that brings us to Honor System version three. Starts in World of Warcraft Legion, goes on forever. I'm sure we'll never do a version four. That would be ridiculous. So here's a look at what that is. And essentially what that is is a PvP talent system. So as you gain honor, you'll actually progress through honor ranks from honor rank one to honor rank 50. And as you progress through those ranks, you earn a number of different perks and bonuses. And the most important ones being these PvP talents that you unlock. These PvP talents are designed completely for PvP. They give us the opportunity that our PvP team has actually been asking for me for a long time to be able to balance PvP more independently of PvE. Because these abilities will only work in places like battlegrounds and arenas. So as you progress through the honor talent tree, you'll unlock the abilities, starting actually top to bottom. So you can very quickly get up to the maximum power that your character can possibly have in terms of just sheer number of abilities and effects and passives, et cetera. And as you progress through that tree, you'll then go on and start unlocking the next row. And that gives you some more options to play with on your character. You might you know, prefer mind quickness you know, versus you know, the train of thought talent, for example. And then finally, you unlock it all at level 50. And so, you know, really that brings us to you know, this idea that we want to take a look at what some of these you know, PvP talents could be. Some examples here, um, obviously only a few examples, and obviously there's going to be a lot of balancing and tuning and tweaking of these PvP talents as we uh, go through the beta process and all that. So some of these may change significantly, but here are some of the core ideas. For example, this first one, the ab abolished magic talent. We envision that as being a talent for the discipline priest, because we think that the discipline priest, in order to restore some of the distinction to all the different PvP specs in the game, all the different specs in the game in general, we feel like the thing that discipline is the best at is dispelling abilities, dispelling magical effects. So here they have this ability on a 20 second cooldown that dispels all magic effects every two seconds for six seconds. It replaces your dispel magic ability. It's just better. Another option here, adaptation. This one is a kind of core anti uh, crowd control ability, where anytime you're struck by a crowd control effect, you become immune for a little while, and then it has an internal cooldown. Uh, we've seen similar sorts of things in other games like Heroes of Storm, for example. We also have Blood and Soil. This is a talent for shamans, and it allows your bloodlust to have a shorter cooldown, but be something that only affects yourself and a single target, rather than the entire group. So it gives you a different spin on an ability that you already have. Another different example would be initiation. This is one that really helps you open up on, on characters that have, you know, uh, at mul you know fat, max XP, I mean, not XP, but HP, you know, they're at full health, so it gives you a boost, boost your crit chance when you first start up on them. We have Mind Quickness, a basic passive, increasing your haste. That gives us kind of a tuning knob for how powerful you can be in PvP versus PvE. Necrotic Strike is another really interesting example. Because in the Necrotic Strike example, this is an ability that Death Knights have had in the past that allows them to build up a heal absorb effect that kind of absorbs incoming heals on the enemy target, which is really cool in PvP in a lot of ways, but didn't really have a lot of use for PvE. And in a world where that's just going to jumble up a lot of people's action bars, it feels a lot better to have that kind of thing in a PvP talent system where those talents that really make sense for PvP can be preserved and have that role in the game and you know, really feel like they're focused and we know exactly what they're for. So that brings us to the next concept, which is prestige. This is a concept that we've seen in other games, obviously like Call of Duty. And the concept here is that if you want to, you can essentially reset your honor level 
and go through it again. And the reason to do this would be for cosmetic rewards entirely. So if you're the type of person that just wants to be as powerful as possible with all the different PvP options, gameplay options available, you get to honor level 50, you're done, call it a day, have fun, kill a bunch of enemies, upgrade your gear slightly, and you know, have a good time. But if you're the kind of person that really likes the prestige type of rewards, the cosmetic things, then you hit the prestige button, get the little warning dialog that'll set you to back to level one of honor rank, and then you go on your way to earning some cosmetic stuff. So for example, you can earn portrait badges to show how many times your character has prestige. So you can see here on the, on the different portraits, you have an escalating badge that gets more and more impressive. This is where we can have things like unique mounts. So in this example, you know, it's one of the black war horses that we'll have that'll be, the only way you can get it is to go through the prestige process. And then finally, probably the coolest prestige item that you can possibly get through the honor system through prestiging are these unique PVP artifact variants. So if you want to get these specific looks for your artifact, the only way to do it is to go through the prestige system. And that'll signify you as somebody who has really done a lot of honor, honor killing. Here's a look at a few more. So a lot of those that, you know, those specific looks that Ian was pointing out, we're going to reserve one for PvP exclusively. They're probably very dark and shady versions of them like that. And so that really summarizes what we're talking about for honor version three. And hope that, uh, you know, to us, it, it, you know, it's really exciting for us because it feels like the most significant change we made to PvP in a long time and hope that you guys are as excited about it as we are. So with that, we conclude our uh, PowerPoint presentation explaining more about the content and features. Um, I want to thank everybody that's been here. Obviously, uh, you know, this has been a lot of stuff to digest and, and want to thank you guys for coming to see us. Really appreciate it. Love you, Gamescom and also everybody that's viewing the live stream worldwide right now. Thank you guys too. Or even if you watch it later, that's got great too. Um, also, we're going to be on the live stream on Sunday where we're going to be answering a number of different questions. Obviously, you know, there are going to be a lot of questions from the community over the next couple of days. We're gonna be keeping our ears opening, listening for questions, and answering as many of them as we reasonably can during the live stream on Sunday. So stay tuned for that. And finally, hope to see you all in the beta later this year. So thank, thank you, you so much, Tom, Ian, and Alex from the World of Warcraft development team. You really shed a lot of light on that expansion for us. And yeah, that even got me more hyped than before. So thank you so much for all those details. We really saw some amazing things to look forward to. And once more, of course, in the name of everyone here, thanks a lot for coming. The guys will be on the live stream, blissgc.com. This is where you can find us from tomorrow onwards. Every evening, we're going to have guests such as the lovely guys here who are uh, talking about their games. And we're going to show what's been happening during the day at BlizzCon, uh, BlizzCon <laughs> at Gamescom. So make sure to tune in for all of that. I thank everyone for watching on stream as well at home. So we hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you.